Stephanie Rule, one of MSNBC's news hosts, actually fines guests on her show $2 for every time that they say the word unprecedented. <laughs> In the moment-by-moment -moment coverage of Donald Trump's gaffes, tweets, lies, and decisions that have turned the office of the President of the United States into a marketing platform for Trump family brands of hotels, golf courses, words like shocking or unprecedented or incomprehensible and even crazy have come up too often. Stephanie just got to a point where it didn't make any sense to keep saying unprecedented, unprecedented when in fact the precedence has been set. It's set at a pretty low bar, uh, but it is a precedent set of a lowbrow, greedy, misogynistic, xenophobic, and dangerously unhinged person who is now the resident of the Oval Office. With this, this week's petty and embarrassing tweet attacking Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski, the outrage has become less divided along party lines as both Republicans and Democrats are just sick of the way that Trump keeps disgracing the office of the president and eroding American credibility around the world. This week's New York Times printed a full page account of Trump's public lies since he took office in January. I tried to reprint those on the cover and back of your bulletin today, but even using the smallest print that Microsoft Word would give me, I couldn't get halfway through April. Now, I love Stephanie Rule. I think she's a great journalist, but this level of tyrannical dishonesty is unprecedented to be able to list clearly objective lies in this number, in this volume, is just unbelievable out of the President of the United States. So on this Independence Day weekend, it's inescapable that along with our celebrations, replete with all the fireworks, cookouts, time spent with family and friends, we also have to acknowledge that our country is in big trouble. And because we are the only remaining superpower in the world, and our economy is, whether we like it or not, our economy is the economic engine of the world. So when our economy gets a cold, the rest of the world gets the flu. What is happening here is having deleterious effects at all corners of the globe. Now, a very wonderful, kind, and intelligent woman in our congregation Holly Ketchum turned her concern for what was happening in our country into a meaningful response by writing a book for children. Donald Trump had campaigned last year under the banner of Make America Great Again. But the subtext of his speeches included fear-mongering of immigrants and illegal aliens, derision of women, the handicapped, and often other races and religions as a whole. Trump blew all of the dog whistles for prejudice, implying that greatness would be restored to our nation by, and I don't think it's a stretch to sum it up this way, that our nation would be great when we put rich white men back in power. Holly's children's book claimed the larger theme titling her book, America Will Be Great When, and on a dozen beautifully illustrated topic pages, talked about our nation's greatness in terms of unity, of caring for the earth, of caring for each other. She addressed very delicately and very lovingly issues related to war and refugees, poverty, racism, religious prejudice, access to health care, housing and education, as well as mental health and appropriate and just care for those with, uh, who are differently abled. There's so much love and kindness in Holly's book that I'm sure that even the most hardened right-wing Fox News consumer would see it as being not controversial, not confrontational. And Holly is to be applauded for this spontaneous gift of affectionate healing of the world. <clears throat> I, 
this is clearly the voice that you talk to five, six, seven, and eight-year-old children in. But I've not been able to shake the belief that there really needs to be a more edgy adult version of this book, that there needs to be a book written in more gloves-off language written for grown-ups. So with Holly's permission to piggyback on her title, I've started writing a new book with which I'm collaborating with other authors to talk seriously about what it's going to take to make America great. The stakes are very high. In Noam Chomsky's most recent book, Requiem for the American Dream, he warns that we may very well be at the most dangerous time in human history. Our very existence is threatened by the dual concerns of nuclear war or destruction of the planet. Our massive military budget is not only bankrupting our ability to accomplish other important goals, but the deployment of forces and hardware all over the globe. It, to quote Bonnie Tyler's 1980s pop song, we're living in a powder keg and giving off sparks. We have created a dynamic in which the world could blow up at any moment. You don't have to have a Hollywood imagination to see several potential scenarios of conflicts with nuclear-armed, unstable states that could lead to a globally lethal nuclear war. And it's no exaggeration, folks, to acknowledge that the United States, the most nuclear-armed nation in the world, has become rather more unstable than it has ever been before. President John Kennedy was able to thread the needle during the Cuban Missile Crisis and barely prevented a nuclear war 50 years ago. But is there anyone, Republican, Democrat, Independent, American, or international, who believes that if Donald Trump had been president on that day, that there would still be a human civilization on the Earth? We've been lucky for 50 years of the nuclear age. But a whole lot of luck has involved having educated, experienced, and qualified people in charge of the nuclear football. We no longer have experienced, educated, and intelligent people in charge of the nuclear football. As for the environment, folks, we've already passed massive tipping points for sea level rise. I may be able to retire one day in Florida. It's even possible that my now 20-something daughter might be able to retire in Florida. But if she has children, and if you're listening, honey, <laughs> it's about time. But if she has children, they probably won't get to retire in Florida because Florida probably won't be there. By that time, Florida will largely be underwater. Horrible things are going to happen over the next century because of what we have already done wrong. The only question is whether we can arrest the speed and the degree of the damage. Our current president, however, seems determined to race to the edge of the cliff of environmental failure like he was Thelma and Louise in the final frames of a movie that is American history. But even if we can, through science and statesmanship, avoid global destruction through war or through environmental collapse, our nation has a whole laundry list of ills, most of which are traceable to the conflict between democracy and capitalism. Now, democracy as a form of government and capitalism as an economic system can and often has worked together with each strengthening the other. However, what we've seen in our lifetimes is what Naomi Klein calls in her new book, No Is Not Enough. What we're seeing is a naked corporate takeover, one many decades in the making. Capitalist interests are no longer simply trying to influence the government. They've removed the middleman, and they have taken charge of the government, turning our democracy into an oligarchy, just like Aristotle predicted 2,500 years ago in his book on politics, that when power moves from the many into the hands of the few, democracy is lost, and we get an oligarchy. 
It is not the sanity and concern for the welfare of the public that has prevented the United States from joining the rest of the Western world and offering universal health care to our citizens. It's, it's not a concern for the welfare of the general population that has kept us from joining the other Western democracies that have made higher education tuition free. It's the control of for-profit corporations over the decisions made for the policies of our government. That's what keeps us invested in military, that's what keeps us from having universal health care, and that's what keeps our colleges and universities largely out of reach of the poor and the middle class. We now have 2.5 million people in prison and more than 9 million on parole, many times more than any other nation in the world per capita, not because we're more evil people and have much more dangerous cr uh, criminal element in our society, but as you can see from this graph, the prison population has shot up. It began to move way up when we declared a war on drugs, when Nixon turned the war on poverty into a war on drugs. But then as the profit motive entered into the prison system, even in the 1990s, the number of incarcerated persons has just exploded. We have an entire nation in prison, not because we have become that dangerous a country, but because our prison system is controlled by for-profit interests. That because incarcerating two and a half million people reduces the available labor force, it creates virtual slave camps while funding jobs, construction, and supply contracts to corporations. Even where there's not for-profit prisons, tremendous profit is made by supplying the prisons, uh, providing the labor to prisons, and in constructing the prisons. We have a million human beings living in tiny cages for no rational reason at all, other than the transfer of wealth from taxpayers to corporations. This is a moral travesty that should be keeping us all awake at night, but unfortunately, it never comes to the front of our awareness until someone we know or love is locked into a cage. Our nation is cursed today with a paucity of jobs that pay a living wage, and our crumbling middle class is sending economic shockwaves around the globe. Our low wages pour gasoline on the chronic fires of poverty everywhere, which combines with our corporate exploitation of poor nations and then our militarily enforced stability. And that, my friends, is what causes terrorism. It is our military presence all over the globe and our exploitation through sweatshops that creates terrorism in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia, in America, and in Australia. Amen. Regional wars create the refugee crisis. And with millions of refugees fleeing violence and economic oppression, it taxes the ability of more stable nations to continue to show tolerance to the waves of immigration coming their way. Domestically, we are facing an opioid overdose crisis. More than 60,000 people died last year from drug overdoses in the United States. That's more than car crashes and gun deaths added together all of which is symptomatic of the despair, the, the poverty, the hopelessness that is especially noticed in the rural parts of our country. The depopulated rural cities are turning to these dangerous opioids at a rate that is absolutely unimaginable. The irony of Trump's campaign slogan, wanting to make America great again, presumes that there was a time in America when we were uniquely great. Well, there have been many times when it has been great to be rich. If you ever get a choice between being rich and being poor, let me just give you a little personal advice. Rich is better. <laughs> Money doesn't buy happiness unless you know where to shop, but 
But America has been great for people that were in power. It's almost always been greater if you're white than if you're something else. And white men have almost always had the top picks of the best jobs with the best salaries. Trump's vision of America's greatness is sort of like an episode of Andy of Mayberry, a tiny town in North Carolina in the 1950s, where, as if by magic, there were only white people in a state that's more than half black. And they were all blissfully happy, and there was only one alcoholic, and he provided comic relief, as if addiction is just hilarious. We tend to romanticize our past as if the failings of our nation are just a recent aberration. At every baseball game, we're asked to stand up and sing our national anthem in those lofty words of Francis Scott Key, inspired by our victory in battle during the War of 1812. But we only sing the first verse about old glory still flying over Fort McHenry after a night of bombardment. The third verse boldly proclaims that indentured servants and African slaves will go to their graves before they can successfully revolt, that their free white masters will keep them in chains. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror or flight or the gloom of the grave, and the star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave white folks. We've never quite made it to that goal of being the shining city on the hill, that truly great society that our patriotic songs and movies have portrayed. Though America has been a beacon of freedom and opportunity for hundreds of millions of people during our brief history, we've never achieved the greatness that we are capable of. It's right here. It's within our grasp but we've never taken hold of it. Through the ingenuity of science, we could, if we could just harness a real unity within our diverse nation, we could bring an end to poverty. We could open the doors of our universities. We could transform our military might into a renewable energy rescue of the planet, making that part that remains above sea level safe for human habitation. We could care for the sick. We could give equal wages to men and women. We could pay everyone a living wage and reduce our imprisoned population to a mere fraction of what it is now. Three-fourths of our prisoners should not be in jail. Many of these ideals wouldn't even be hard to accomplish if we could just swing the pendulum away from capitalism towards democracy to shift from creating a super rich class to creating a very civilized world. Now, all governments rule by the consent of the governed. But we have a long history of having our consent manipulated out of us through fear and through propaganda. So that historically, we consented to slavery. We have consented to unjust wars, to economic and racial segregation, to exploitation of the poor and, and uh, exploit or, or discrimination against people for their gender or their sexual uh, orientation. Well, let me just say this. That government doesn't get my consent anymore. I'm not giving my consent to any government that doesn't promote liberty and justice for all. Amen. I've never seen that government. I haven't seen it yet. But I do have faith that it's out there. Right now, it only exists in our hearts and in our imaginations. But together, we can make America great. And because it is a possibility, we are obligated to do it. Amen. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.